let's start with this year's cars. Uh, both you and Toyota have shown up with hybrids, although very different philosophies in their design. Could you uh, explain a little bit why you chose to go the direction you did and, and how you may see that as advantageous over your competitors? Uh, to start with, I found it very funny to see Toyota come with a system they don't sell. Because they sell to the customer something completely different. The first, number one. Secondly, it's, it's the physics you look behind. When you look the supercapacitor thing, this allows you to absorb a lot of energy in a very short time at very high voltage levels, but you don't have a lot of power because just the voltage is high, but the current. We, on the other hand, we tried to make a combination of uh, a mechanical uh, system, inertia system, which is speeding up, and so it can absorb a lot of energy and a lot of power in a very short time, and then, via rotation, transform it into voltage and to get it back at any time we want to the wheels and to propulsion. It gives us more freedom than, for example, as I understood the system from Toyota to do it with the supercapacitors. And at much lower voltage, because it's also a question of safety. What's your thought on, on, the, um, on the drive? They went with rear-wheel drive, so they can use it at any time. You guys went with, of course, it's a Heritage of Quattro, but you have to be over 120 to use it. There's a reason why Audi is selling Quattros. One of the reasons why we made this front axle driven, not because we wanted to have a Quattro. We know this is a very good system, and everyone who is buying an Audi Quattro knows that. It doesn't have to discuss about. But there's one very essential thing you have to know. When you make brake engine recovery, like we are using here, so you are recovering the energy in braking, then you have to know that every car, whether it's a race car or road car, has a dynamic load transition to 60 to 70 percent on the load on the front wheels when you are braking. So it means they are much, much more difficult to lock up than the rear wheels, because in the same time the rear wheels come up, the rear wheels get light, so they get much easier to lock, or in the other way, you are limiting the amount of energy you can recover when you have a hybrid in the rear. It's quite simple physics. I don't know why they did it different, but it's like that. Do you think there's an advantage? I mean, they make you go over 120 to use the, the Quattro system. Is there an advantage uh, yet still to have if there's bad weather, uh, there's rain, a traction advantage at that speed? Or is, is it, at that point, is it more just acceleration? Uh, first of all, they took us away quite some advantage by not allowing us to use the front wheel lower than 120 k's an hour because this would help us to get out of corners much better than we can do with the rear wheel drive. And with regard to the weather conditions, we first experienced this advantage when we raced in Spa. When we had the direct comparison, hybrid and non-hybrid, same engine, same power, same configuration, and the, the, the Quattro, the e-tron Quattro, had an advantage of something like 10 seconds per lap, and the lap being something like 120 seconds, so it's a massive advantage, but it disappeared in a moment that the, the track became dry. What will happen long term in terms of tire use and things like that, we will experience when we are raced, when we have raced here in 24 hours, then we know much more about it. One of the reasons why we are using two concepts in parallel, because we would like to know that. Did you notice much of a, a tire difference at Spa? Tire difference? No, because the race was just 1,000 km, you know. And here we are racing, depending on the weather, something like 5,500. So we, we have a lot of more opportunity to find out how the tires are behaving under different temperature levels because you have maybe hot times during the day, it's cold in the night, and each time the behavior of the tire and this e-tron quattro may change or not. We don't know it. Yet. You mentioned uh, the production question with Toyota and the system that they've gone with. Is there, is there a production possibility for something like a flybrid? Is, is, that some, is that really something more specific for racing? or? I think at least if you develop it for a race, then you have the chance, because then you know the advantages and disadvantages. We all know about the disadvantage of batteries. They are expensive, they are heavy, and sometimes they are burning, as we could see in a recent accident in China. So these things are not so really easy to handle. 
Whereas a flybrid system or a system we are using electromechanical storage system, when this wheel stops, everything stops. The current has gone down, so there is no danger to touch it, nothing. It's just gone. So you don't have this massive weight, you have this moving part, okay, it's turning with a 50 or 60 or 40,000 RPM per minute, but when you are driving with a turbocharged car, your turbocharger is running at 150,000 RPM, you don't care about that. And if it bursts, then it bursts, but it is covered, and so nothing can happen to you except that you have a loss of power, that's all. That's why we are going that, and long term, this may become an alternative in our road cars. We will see what the future brings, but we have an alternative to what we are selling actually to our customers. It seems like the electrically driven front wheels and the quattro system in the e-tron, you hear things from executives from time to time, and looking at some of the prototypes even they built in A5 or whatever else, it seems like that concept is definitely being looked at. Yeah, I think this, this electric driven axle, whether it's a rear or a front, allows you to add to any kind of car. It's a front wheel driven car, which we are selling as well. You can make an electric driven rear wheel. So you have a quattro, an inverse system like we have here on the racetrack, because typically you have the mid and mid-sized or the mid-placed engine and a rear wheel driven, because this is the law here. You cannot make a front wheel drive car, so it has to be a rear wheel driven race car. So the alternative is to go to the front axle for the reasons I have described earlier on, with using with the use of all the physical laws that can help you to generate and recover more energy than you would ever do with a rear wheel hybrid. Looking towards the future, the ACO announced uh, rules changes today. Uh, what, what, what is your take on it and uh, where do you think this will go? I think basically everybody has to understand why these rules have been made and what is the main purpose. The main purpose of these rules are, is to develop technology to create powertrains with more efficiency than before. More than a hundred years, people, engines, engineers have developed engines to generate more power out of a volume with turbo, with compressor, with all kinds of things. <clears throat> now, from 2014 on, we will be rewarded only if we are able to make a powertrain, and to call it a powertrain, it's not only the combustion engine, but also energy recovery systems around the engine. Can be a turbocharger, electric driven turbocharger, can be whatever you can imagine. No, at the moment we don't know it yet. We will discover some things, I'm sure. But you have to develop these things to get a reward on an efficient engine when you have an, a limited amount of energy per lap. And the engine or the powertrain or the car equipped with that is the, the quickest and the, is, which is the most efficient because it has more bonus out of the given energy so it will be faster than everybody else. And this is exactly what our customers expect from our new generation cars. They want to have the same amount of fun, the same speed, but less consumption, less pollution and less pay on the tax on the, on the, on the, on the station. So that's the logic behind it. The, the, the difficulty is now to find all systems which are thinkable, balanced in a fair way. It means gasoline engine, diesel engine, big hybrids, small hybrids, all things have to be balanced. And this was a hell of a work in the last couple of months together with the sporting authorities, FIA and ACO, to discuss and evaluate what is the best solution. And as far as I could see now the faces, nobody was happy. And this is always a sign for a good compromise. If, 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 uh, if you, in the past, the R8 days, you just had to worry about an engine. At FSI, okay, this sounds like a whole new ball game for you. How much more of a challenge for you is, is, our, is a new rules package like this? Uh, it's a fantastic challenge for every engineer. And it is not only because it's an engineering task, it's also, you have the feeling now, you are doing something which I always claim I'm doing, but now I'm more forced, well, I don't have to be forced, but I, it's a force that really di directs you in the direction to do the things the world needs now. Makes better use of the energy which is available, 
lightweight technology, build more efficient cars with less road resistance, all these things we will see from 2014 on and this will allow us to develop things again and again which we can use in our road cars in a very short time after we have hopefully made the victory here in Le Mans which is always the best proof that the technology was the right one. You mentioned in the meeting how there were a lot of uh, very, not very happy faces, so an indication of a compromise. Yet I look at you and you're brimming with excitement. Is that is that part of the the, the sort of environment of it, the engine that's so strong in engineering at Audi that kind of you exemplify that? It is. It is. Let's say. It. Not a satisfaction about the rules as rules, right. but a satisfaction about the fact that the rules have taken a direction like that, which I'm claiming since many, many years, that the end, at the end of the day, rules should be based on energy. And that's what's happened now. And this is now the result of a year-long conviction work and discussions and, and, and on. And this is something that makes me smile. Not specifically for Audi, just for motorsport in general, and for Limor as a special place where you can and they have a tradition about that to develop new technologies which can come into production cars later on and I think this is a fantastic continuation of the story which has happened or started 80, more than 80 years ago here in this place. Don't forget this race started in 1923, is the second oldest after Indy, Indy 500 is still a little bit older. But you could see how different ways racetracks can take, you know, the one is entertainment and the other is for technology. It's Shame to say that, but it is like that. It, it may not be a story about engines, but one of the the, the big stories this week is the Delta Wing, yeah. and, and it breaks a lot of molds in racing. What's your take on the Delta Wing project? Yes, um, Ben Bowl, we did a fantastic job, and it needed a lot of courage to do that. And I'm in touch with this project since the very beginning, because we sat together, I think it was three years ago, on a rainy day in Sebring for a test, and he came, I never met him before, and I said, I'm Ben Bowlby, I would like to talk to, about the project, I would like to have your opinion. And when I meet him, he always says, you are one of the fathers, because if you wouldn't have encouraged me to do that, I wouldn't have done it. And to make a car with half the weight, half the consumption, half the performance of the engine is a huge, huge step in the right direction. We all have to learn about that and it gives a complete different image of a car. When you look back in the, in the, in the old films, the sports cars here in Le Mans have an appearance which is very similar over the years, just the color changes and the materials. One was aluminium, now it's carbon fiber, but the overall shape is very similar to what in the 70s, 80s, 90s. This car has a complete different appearance. This shows in the future. Whether the car will look like that in three years time or not, but it makes people think about what you can be done to reduce consumption without losing entertainment, without losing thrill in racing. And that's, I can just congratulate Ben about this thing. I really can just congratulate you. Have you had a chance to watch the car on track? Yes, what are your yesterday about? and already in Sebring when we have been there for testing, it was there for one day. It was fantastic to look at that and to re see also the drivers, how they are a little bit nervous about the car because it looks so different to what they are used to. So they were a little bit scared about go around the corner, what would happen with the car. Will it ever go around the corner? This was one of the main questions in the beginning. Yes, it does. You can see it. And I'm sure if the car would undergo a really budget-founded development process like all the other cars, you would see them on top of the LMP2s, I'm sure about that, with much less power. Don't forget, this is a 300 horsepower engine, small four-cylinder, so, and a very low consumption. This is the way to go. Fascinating. I, I must say, I always enjoy talking to you. The, 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 the energy with which you approach the, the engineering aspect of, of this race and motorsport in general. Is in this business, you have to be crazy or really passionate about it. The best is both. If not, you go crazy. So you would say you're more passionate than crazy or more crazy than passionate? Depends on the day and the subject. <laughs> Racing, it's passionate. Uh, yes, uh, yes, yes. Thank yes. you very much. It was a pleasure.